Trade Union Federation Casato is calling for an overhaul of the PIC as well as the compensation fund. It's also gearing up for a national strike set for Wednesday to highlight the country's socioeconomic conditions. Let's expand on this with Casato's Deputy Parliamentary Coordinator, that's Matthew Parks. Mr. Parks, good morning and thank you very much for your time. Now we understand that you're calling for an overhaul of the PIC and UIF. Just expand on this for us. Yes, no, thanks. Um, these are critical institutions which are meant to benefit workers, and we think there are significant gaps. Um, over the course of COVID-19, for the past two years, we managed to release 64 billion rand from the Unemployment Insurance Fund to benefit um, 5.5 million workers in the private sector. But many workers experience huge delays in accessing their funds. There's a really a need to modernize the UF, but also so many instances of fraud and corruption where employers deducted funds from workers allegedly to pay the UF and didn't do so. So they need to tackle those kind of issues. But also we have seen about 4 million workers who don't currently fall under the UAF or the Compensation of Injury on Duty Fund because the nature of work is evolving. It might be a domestic worker who's got four different employers. It might be farm workers, which is difficult to reach. It might be Uber drivers who are self-employed allegedly or e-platform workers, Uber mm. Eats, et cetera. It's less than workers too. So we need to modernize our institutions to make sure they really do provide the support that workers, that the economy requires. We've seen with the CCMA that because of budget cuts to it, it no longer takes about a month to have your hearing heard. It takes about three months. So they need to invest in them to modernize the IT systems, to employ additional staff so they provide the rapid response service that workers, that the economy, the businesses really need to enable the economy to grow effectively. So those are the kind of things we're looking at. Um, we're having our Congress in next month. We hope to have kind of, you know, rich, robust debates about different affiliates. But these are kind of proactive modernization, pro-worker types of interventions we're looking at. Mm -hmm. I love some of these interventions that you have because you're talking to the real issues that people are facing. Particularly, I want to take you back to the UIF when you talk about domestic workers who might be working for more than one individual. And sometimes it's because of the reality of finances that even an employer might not be able to have their domestic worker working five days a week anymore and frees them up to work at other employers but then how would one go about calculating how much they are liable to pay for their for that individual for that one day a week that they work for them what do you propose no, that's exactly it so we do and we don't have all the answers that's exactly we need to kind of think creatively how do you do it because the previous nature of work of our parents etc where you entered a workplace at the age of 18 and you worked until 65 that's over the nature of work is evolving rapidly. You might have five or six different employers. You might be self-employed, or you might be an artist or musician or an actor who works um, for one night this week, doesn't work next week, mm -hmm. or might have a gig for three months or six months and then is unemployed. So we need to find what is a creative model that takes care of the normal type of work, the factory or the formal work, but also begins to cater for the atypical type of work, the informal work. It needs to be a bit more hybrid, a bit more modernized. Um, and we think there is ways to do it. You could, for example, simply say that, well, pay a flat rate. Um, but again, it's about the modalities because we have really seen that, you know, during COVID, we have about 900,000 workers who work as domestic workers, but only about 20,000 or so receive money from the UF. And in, in re reality, it's because most of them are simply not registered. Either they don't know about their rights, they're afraid to exercise their rights, or they don't know how to do it. Equally, the employers, the employers might just simply not be aware of it may find it difficult to go to the UF to register. So we really need to think of some creative ideas that um, address the legal loopholes, but also make it efficient and, and user-friendly for, for the worker, for the employer mm -hmm. to be in good compliance. And then when we speak of the PIC, I mean, many are still concerned by the fact that the Mbati Commission Concluded, it had over 300 recommendations to improve governance there. But details around the implementation process are very thin. All we know is that, at least from the board, they've said that they've implemented the recommendations, but we don't necessarily have the names of those they've taken through disciplinary processes, those that are being criminally pursued, or even those that have they have recouped monies from, as per the recommendations, that monies must be recouped for failed investments. Are you perhaps aware or privy to some of these details? Yes. Look, I mean, so we raised the alarm bell around the PIC, I think, in about 2016, uh, when we really saw that there was an unbelievable amounts of, of corruption taking place, of wastage of workers' money. And the PIC, it's important to remember, is workers' money. 87% um, of it is the government employee pension fund, that's public service pensions. The remaining amount is largely the unemployment insurance fund and the compensation of injury on duty fund. So it's workers' monies. We were quite alarmed to see continuous reports in the media about politicians and their families and friends basically just looting it, and hence the Empathic Commission. 
Um, a new board has been appointed. We overhauled the PIC Amendment Act to make the transparency and accountability mechanisms. We put in place anti-corruption provisions, put in place work representation on the PIC board for the first time in its 100 years existence. So there's been quite a good, uh, significant turnaround. We've had quite a few engagements with the PIC leadership. Um, there's a new CEO who's committed to dealing with corruption. So they've been doing some good work there. But I think the level of... Um, of rot and many of the investments is still significant. We need to do more to up uproot it. But whilst the PIC has done some good work to fire some corrupt and compromised officials in the PIC, including very senior officials, um, that has been the public domain, we think there's a need for a much, more, a much deeper systematic approach because there's a huge investment fund. It's worth about 2.3 trillion rand. It's the biggest investment fund in the continent. Um, it's invested in virtually every single listed economy in company in South Africa and many unlisted. It has a huge role to play in terms of protecting workers when they retire, the public servants, but also protecting ordinary workers when they lose their jobs or they're injured at work. So there is good progress, but I think much more needs to be done. And we are actually having monthly engaged with the PIC um, to begin to assist them to, to uproot this and put it on a, on a correct path. Mm -hmm. And then to the nationwide strike from this Wednesday, how are preparations coming along? And can you, in fact, confirm that you will be working with SAFTA, you're putting your differences aside, or this will be a separate one for them? Sure. Look, preparations are going quite well. We've had our, our unions, be it teachers, be it clothing workers, be it retail workers, mine workers, municipal workers, have been mobilizing across the country. They've been having shop steward councils, meetings at workplaces. There's quite a bit of excitement. And the essence, this is about workers raising their voice of anger, of frustration, of disgruntlement about the rising fuel prices, rising food prices, um, the levels of corruption in state and the municipalities, workers losing their jobs, workers struggling to get to work with the collapse of metro rail lines. So it's about their chance to tell to government to get us act together, to tell to employers to treat workers better. Um, it is a message to workers also that unions are taking their, their plight seriously. They need to kind of redouble their efforts to put pressure on employers and government to do better. And it's open to all workers in all workplaces. It's open to all unions. So we have extended the invitation to other federations like Producer and Arctic, which have supported us. We've extended it to SAFTA as well, which also indicated they'll be joining us as well. Um, and so for us, it's not about the color of our T-shirt. Um, it's about addressing workers' issues. If we don't address those workers' issues, then we'll all be together in the unemployment queue with our T-shirts. So I think for us, it's really about putting pressure. And there has been a significant shift in the past few years where we've seen unions across federations working very closely together. Uh, we saw it at Sibani with NUM and AMCU and Solidarity in Uasa. We've seen it at ESCOM with NUM and NUMSA. We've seen it in many different industries. And really, that's what we want. We want workers to be working together to address the fundamental crisis of unemployment, of poverty, of corruption, of load shedding, uh, because those crises don't care about the kind of teachers, they will affect everybody equally. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's what many have been saying, that you're stronger together as a labor movement as opposed to when you're divided. So hopefully all goes well. We'll see you on the picket lines. Thank you very much. That's Kasatu Deputy Parliamentary Coordinator Matthew Parks. To the